Welcome to MTN Outdoors. Hi there, I'm John Riley, and welcome to this episode of MTN Outdoors. To celebrate St. Patrick's Day, I'm here with Montana's most famous Irishman, Thomas Francis Marr. Now we've got a great episode for you, and first we're headed up to the Flathead to take a look at the lake levels. I'm bringing your news today from Polson on the shore of the beautiful Flathead Lake, where I want to share two stories that both take a look back and try to look into the future. Step back in time with me to last summer when Flathead Lake was at its lowest level in a generation. We heard from people who lived on the lake, upset that their boating season was cut short. We also went to the people managing the water level through the SKQ Dam. There was a lot of finger pointing, but the science doesn't lie. We have conditions now that nobody has ever experienced that are that is alive today. We have some climatological changes that are happening now that we all have to appreciate and look at. Those changes are the rapidly increasing global temperature. Brian Lipscomb, CEO of Energy Keepers, says the temperature changes are driving the extremes we're seeing today. We'll just see what happens this year. We're starting at a at what may be worse conditions, at least snowpack wise, but we'll have to see what the, the rest of March brings for us. Citizens filed more than 25 formal complaints against energy keepers last year, saying private boat docks were inaccessible, swimming and boating were hazardous, and the lake levels hurt business. This prompted the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to investigate how the company managed the flow out of the dam. The FERC released their findings last month, saying energy keepers succeeded in managing the lake to their licensing requirements. It was a, a satisfaction from our perspective that our regulator would come out and say, yeah, you are in fact following the license. I mean, we pride ourselves in doing that. Lipscomb told me that they are trying to be more transparent in their decision making this year. They've hired a communications coordinator and in a few weeks will be delivering a seminar to anyone interested in learning about lake levels and where to find that data. The lake should begin filling in the next few weeks with full pool likely happening sometime in May. As I mentioned before, Flathead Lake is a massive economic engine for communities here. So I went to a Ronan Chamber of Commerce meeting to see how the levels impacted them. You know, we're a gateway to Glacier, we're a gateway to Missoula and bigger cities, and we need people, we rely on people stopping during the tourist season. So we definitely saw a reduction last summer. Whitney Delgakis is a Ronan native and is a board member for the chamber. She said Ronan businesses suffered from both the lake levels and construction along the Highway 93 corridor. Um, anecdotally, you know, a number of them said it was a heavy hit to their bottom line. And uh, while traffic is obviously flowing better now and it's great to see that improvement, there are now multiple lanes. And so this summer, you know, if those lanes are all full, people are going to need to make a concerted effort to get into those businesses. And we really hope that they will and we encourage them to. Ronan, however, bounced back with several new stores opening up recently and a downtown master plan in the works. The city recently received grant money for the planning process and Lagakis said to expect exciting changes coming soon. Ronan is a really fun town. We're an ag town, but we also have really good food and really good beer and drinks. We have really positive momentum. I feel like especially downtown, we're seeing that. Glacier National Park reports hosting 2.9 million visitors last year. According to the park, visits were up nearly 1% from the previous year and ranked as the sixth busiest year for the park. But visitation has remained at about the 3 million mark for the past five years. The numbers come as the National Park continues to refine a vehicle reservation program aimed at spreading traffic throughout the day, particularly around attractions like going to the Sun Road. It's March, which means it's time for your new conservation license, as MTN's Chet Lehman reports. March 1st marked the beginning of the new licensing year for the Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife and Parks. It also marked the beginning of year two of a requirement that says all people over the age of 12 using fishing access sites, wildlife management areas or other DNRC land in the state of Montana buy a conservation license to help pay for maintenance. Uh, what this does is it generates uh, funding for the maintenance, upkeep and care of these facilities that see really a a lot of use throughout the year. That requirement went in last year. Up to that point, the only funds available for upkeep came from those who bought hunting and fishing licenses. Fairly small group of the actual population 
who use these sites on a yearly basis. We're seeing all kinds of recreation at uh, these state sites. Uh, anything from floating and boating to uh, picnicking and, and all these things uh, that, uh, that do, you know, have, uh, you know, take, take a toll on, on the maintenance, depending on how many people come in and, and use these sites. FWP has made meeting this requirement pretty simple and inexpensive. If you're getting a hunting or fishing license, you're already taking care of this requirement. If you don't participate in either of those activities, but still plan to use these lands, it's a simple procedure you can complete on your phone. Really easy to be able to obtain that license. You can go online to our website at fwp.mt.gov. You click on the buy and apply uh, link and, and uh, you'll be able to get a, a conservation license uh, from your phone, from your, from your house, or if you want to come in and talk to us, you can come down to uh, fit the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks office in Bozeman. Conservation license will remain valid until the end of February of next year. And again, as a requirement for anyone over the age of 12 using any of these state lands, for any activity. Sitting on a picnic table at the Cameron Bridge Fishing Access Site near Belgrade with my valid conservation license, Chet Lehman, MTN News. At the beginning of March, FWP opened some of their watercraft inspection stations across the state, and they're already catching mussel fouled boats. A contaminated pontoon boat was intercepted at the Anaconda Watercraft Inspection Station on March 10th. The boat was recently purchased used in North Dakota and was traveling along Interstate 90 west towards Washington. Mussels were found along the hull throughout. Inspectors performed a full decontamination on site and the boat was locked to the trailer. All watercraft, motorized and non-motorized, coming into Montana from out of state must be inspected and boaters are required to stop at all inspection stations. It's a nice horse. And speaking of horses, we now head to Red Lodge, where the National Ski Juring Finals were held. Horses and ski, don't get much better than that. I suppose Houston is right. That's all you really need to know to have your interest peaked in ski juring. I just got invited by some friends to come watch the ski juring. I guess it's horses pulling people on skis. That's a little more the idea. An incredibly Norwegian sounding extreme winter sport is really just the act of sled racing led by an animal. It's just a super fun sport where the skiers meet the horsemen that you'd probably never meet. We started it with dogs originally pulling skiers and then it changed to the horses. But the inevitable next question is of course. Can you explain the rules to me? I have no clue. It's the fastest time in each event and you gotta hit, well the little kids don't, it doesn't matter if they hit the gates or not, but you have to hit the gates and the jumps. No faults, no wrecks, yep. and then the fastest time wins. More of a partnership than a random pairing. The relationship between skiers and riders makes this a sort of team sport. It's hard to like match up horses and riders, or horses and pullers, or skiers yeah. too, because you gotta get just the right combination in order for it to make it a, a good team. Pairings haven't always been so strategic, however. Some places we would draw names out of a hat, and that would be your partner. Camaraderie is second to none. It's just that fun. Marty Steffes says his time to skijor has come and gone. The rough and tumble, slip and slide makes this a young person's game. Now I'm retired, so we brought a fire pit, and we got the pickups back in, and straw on the ground, and you gotta have right boots on, because you'll drown if you don't. <laughs> but. There's nothing sad about sitting on the sidelines. We do a good old long list a week ahead of time. Make sure we got everything. It's almost like camping. Marcus Kukova, MTN News. Coming up after the break, it's all about the dogs. But first, it's time for some trivia. Thomas Marr had a significant impact on Montana, serving as the Secretary of the Territory and Acting Governor. But just how many years did the Irish Revolutionary live in Montana? That answer coming up after the break. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back. So do you know how many years Thomas Francis Marr lived in Montana? After the Civil War, Marr was appointed Secretary of the Territory in 1865 and was quickly designated acting governor after Sidney Edgerton left. Marr called the first constitutional convention a step towards statehood, but not enough residents voted for it to qualify. Then in the summer of 1867, Marr fell overboard a steamboat into the waters of the Missouri, believing to have died. Quite the legacy for only two years in Montana. 
Mars death has been and continues to be debated by historians. Was it an accident or was it foul play? Which brings us to our next story by Alina Howder, as families in Montana are searching for answers after finding their dogs poisoned. Two families here in Roundup are mourning the unexpected losses of their dogs. After one of the owners found meatballs filled with bluish green crystals here in their backyard, they believe their pups were poisoned. Babies. For Roundup resident Cricket Nichols, her animals are her world. We might have a lot of them, but they are all very, very well taken care of. You know, they get so much attention from everybody that is in our life. But her eight dogs and seven cats received the wrong kind of attention at the end of February. I saw all but one of our cats throw up and all but one of the dogs. Despite aid from her vet, the mysterious illness hit Shasta, Cricket's pregnant two pound chihuahua, the hardest. First she vomited blood and then um, blood coming out of her nose and mouth. A couple of days later, she was gone. And according to Cricket's vet, she was poisoned. So I walked our entire fence line and I found probably 10 or 15. They look like meatballs. Um, as soon as I picked them up, they literally like just disintegrated in my hands and it left behind the kind of blue and bluish green crystals. For Cricket's cousin, Heaven Benson, the story was all too familiar. I called for him on the 13th of February. Um, he was just not, he hadn't eaten in a few days. He, there was um, blood clot vomit uh, for the last couple days about it. Heaven had to put down her 14 year old black lab blue healer mix Hunter on February 23rd after he suffered from multiple seizures. It devastated my daughter. My son couldn't even be in the room. He had to leave the house until it was over. Heaven's vet told her Hunter was overdosing. Now, the cousins believe their family is being targeted. Cricket called Muscle Shoal County Sheriff's Office to report the incident, but she says they wouldn't take her report. We have a video, but it's not very clear. You can't really tell who it is, so they basically told us our, their hands were tied. They couldn't exactly help us. They just said to watch our pets better. MTN reached out to the Muscle Shoal County Sheriff's Office Friday for more information and was told it has not received any reports of the animals being poisoned. Sheriff Sean Lesnick tells us it can be a difficult crime to prove and intent is hard to prove as well. But for Cricket and Heaven, it's a scary situation, especially with two toddlers in Cricket's care. To whoever is doing this, just why, you know, why would you put somebody else through this pain? Because I literally feel like I lost my kid. In Roundup, Alina Howder, MTN News. For a group of mushers out here in Mill Creek, dog sledding is an escape from reality, a way to connect with nature and man's best friend. But that doesn't mean there aren't possible dangers. Watching them realize all the things that they can do is really amazing. Um, and the time that we spend on trail is just, you know, I've gotten to see some places that I probably would never get to see. Charmaine Morrison is a musher who competes and takes people on dog sledding journeys. In fact, she's training for the next Iditarod trail sled dog race in Anchorage, Alaska. Working with animals is, is a bit different than working with a team of humans. You know, they can't quite communicate in the same ways. These are Charmaine's passionate teammates who can't contain their excitement to run, as you can hear. But once they get the command to take off, all is quiet. In a way, it's sort of like meditating. But that doesn't mean there aren't dangerous possibilities to prepare for. At the 2024 I Did a Rod, musher Dallas Seavey was forced to shoot and kill a moose to protect himself and his team when the moose became entangled with his dogs. Moose will kill the dogs. It's happened. Rob Greger, Charmaine's partner and coach, has been mushing for 37 years and competed in the Iditarod twice. Um, here at Mill Creek is one of the first places I started running dogs. He says knowing the trail you're running can make a difference in safety, but still, you never know when you'll be taken by surprise. A lot of mushers carry guns, not all of them. And um, I've encountered moose, but most of the time, they will wander off the trail. One particular scare for Gregor happened in West Yellowstone. Heard of bison, full blast running at us. And my daughter goes, what do we do? I said, stop the team, put your hooks in, wave your arms. And the buffalo luckily let, ah, and turned around and ran in the other direction. 
From snowmobiles to stray dogs running off leash, the list goes on of potential dangers while dog sledding, according to Gregor. The team got hit by a truck up here. Um, not too terrible, but dogs got injured. Upsetting, but Gregor says the rewards outweigh the risks. There's a special bond between dogs at work. The personal challenge of taking on something that is so much bigger than just yourself. In Paradise Valley, Joe Lisa Lee, MTN News. What's better than a relaxing yoga class? A yoga class that's filled with puppies and is for a good cause. There was nothing out of the ordinary here. A peaceful yoga class that quickly turned into a furry frenzy when they let the dogs out. It's therapy, it really is. The foster home-based nonprofit Res Dog Rescue recently held a puppy yoga class, a cute, chaotic, and charitable course. It's just a way to get people out to know, to, to learn about us, to socialize the puppies. And of course, fundraiser. Just a good way to just make a couple extra bucks. With 50 people and many puppies, the room was full of smiles and wagging tails. It was so much fun, obviously pet puppies more than did yoga. Res Dog Rescue's mission is to help stray dogs on reservations. They spay and neuter dogs, leave food out for strays, and rescue puppies and injured dogs. This is Wink. He's one of the ones we brought in in the last couple litters, and he had his eye was bulging out and um, so we had to remove it. As the weather warms up, saving pups like Wink will surge. They currently have around 50 dogs in their care and are in need of more foster homes. We do what we can. By the end of the class, hearts were full and pups dozed off, dreaming of the families who would adopt them and the other dogs within the rescue. We have adults that have been with us for over a year and they need homes too. In Billings, Haley Monaco, MTN News. Coming up after the break, we see receding efforts underway after wildfire and look to the skies around Great Falls. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back. It's an effort to restore a scorched area and a partnership between the Bureau of Land Management and Special K Ranch near Columbus. MTN's Kelsey Boggs has the full story. Here at Special K Ranch in Columbus, a special seating operation. As the ranch works on some post-fire rehab, following the 2021 Robertson Draw Fire that heavily impacted the sagebrush in the area. Just watering and stuff. At Special K Ranch in Columbus, <laughs> residents have been hard at work as they prep for a special project. BLM had 10,000 acres burned and 8,000 of that we're looking to reseed. Back in 2021, the Robertson Draw Fire, sparked just outside of Red Lodge, destroyed nearly 30,000 acres of land, 10,000 of which belonged to the Bureau of Land Management. Planting these sagebrush seedlings out there is gonna help us to get those, those seeds back in the places they need to be and let nature take its course. Sagebrush was wiped out, important vegetation that provided habitat to sage grouse, a near threatened species. The perennial flowering plants are what the sage grouse chicks need for those first three, five months of life. So if they have just patches of this stuff, well, that's what's important. Marvin Schiltz is the program director at Special K Ranch, a nonprofit working ranch for adults with developmental disabilities. We don't want to just be captivated here. We want them to get out and be able to experience life like all the rest of us get to do. On Wednesday, residents were busy using their green thumbs. Perfect. Working together to help out BLM, where Ed Peterson has worked for the past 36 years. I love BLM. It's just a great, great, agency partnering to make a difference gives our bunch just a good exposure to regular life and that's what we want to do in columbus kelsey boggs mtn news it's out with the old and in with the new as malmstrom air force Base brings in their mh 139a helicopters to replace the hueys that they have been serving with since 1970. you know it's been in the works the the acquisition process has been in the works um you know there's there's people who have been retired now um, who have been told for, for a number of years that uh, they were getting a new helicopter. And, and don't get me wrong, we love, we love flying the Huey. Um, she's reliable, of course she's historic, 
um, and we have a great time, but uh, the difference is uncanny between the two. The new MH-139A Grey Wolf helicopters are 50% faster, can travel 50% further, have a 30% larger cabin, and can lift 5,000 more pounds than their outdated counterparts. For the foreseeable future, um, we're going to see the Huey start to phase out and the 139 starting to take its spot, and then uh, we're expecting to have it for, for decades to come. Compared to the old-fashioned, more manual UH-1N Huey helicopters, the new Grey Wolf helicopters have state-of-the-art avionics and autopilots, which ultimately help reduce the pilot and crew workload required while flying. There will be definitely a, a, a mind shift um, going from one helicopter to the other, but we have a lot of those um, training opportunities in place so that we'll be able to make that conversion seamlessly. Additional speakers at the ceremony included U.S. Senator John Tester, Lieutenant Colonel Tyler Williams, and Vice President and General Manager of Boeing Vertical Lift, Ms. Kathleen Jolivet. They have flown in a perfectly capable helicopter, and in the next coming weeks, we're going to see more and more getting shipped. Um, we're expecting one more next week and two in, in a month from now. Well, the Huey is an iconic helicopter that served the Air Force for decades. It's fair to say that an upgrade is long overdue. In Great Falls, I'm Tommy Lynch, MTN News. And we're not the only ones who are enjoying this spring-like weather. Check out this elk herd MTN's Kiana Wilson spotted. She caught the herd grazing in a field in the Creston area, where Highway 206 meets Highway 35. It's not unusual, though. The elk are known to frequent the fields on and around Highway 206. The warmer weather is a good reminder that other animals may be out and about, such as bears. And heading down to Yellowstone Park, the first grizzly bear has been seen in the park out and about this spring. And remember, bears can be a little bit cranky waking up from that winter break. Always be sure to remain bear aware and carry bear spray when you're out recreating. Thanks for joining us on this Thomas Marr themed episode of MTN Outdoors. Mars' death to this day remains a mystery, which is why we're here on the banks of the Missouri River. As you can see, I've got a healthy distance between me and the river because it's already claimed at least one Irishman, and it's not getting this one. <laughs>